Thank you very much. I never dreamed that as a staff sergeant who fought the Korean War in Europe and Africa with a typewriter, I'd be asked to address such a <laughs> prestigious group. You know, we, uh, we get a lot of questions about our title, Relentless Pursuit, and um, a few uh, veterans thought that we were referring, at one time they called the uh, fighter planes pursuit, pursuit aircraft, pursuit fighters. But that was not the origin of the title. It refers much more to the fact of the, the Thorpe family for more than 60 years fought to get information about their son and brother with very little success, I might add. And then for the past eight years, it's been a, a real quest for me uh, interviewing former members of the 39th, uh, researching the history, especially what happened in New Guinea and Australia. But the story really begins in 1944. I was 13 years old, the same age as my neighbor, Gilthorpe. He lived one street away from me in Edgewood. I had two brothers, one fighting with the 1st Marine Division, in the Pacific and another brother with the 82nd Airborne in Europe. Gil had a brother, Bob, who was a P-47 pilot in New Guinea. We never, we exchanged war stories, probably embellished, but we never had too much, we, we weren't really worried about our brothers because, you know, John Wayne was winning the war in the Pacific and <laughs> Errol Flynn was taking care of the Nazis and only bad guys got killed in war. And then something happened in early June of 1944 that changed our thinking dramatically. An army car pulled up in front of the Thorpe home. Gil was there, age 13, with his sister Nancy, who was 15. The parents were not there. And two officers came to the door, and when they were told that the parents weren't there, they handed Gil a telegram and said, Tell your parents your brother is missing in action. We felt a little different about the war after that. Nothing much happened in 1945. The designation missing in action was changed to killed in action. And I remembered going to a memorial service for Bob Thorpe with my friends in 1945. And then nothing more was said we just thought Bob had probably been lost at sea, and that was it. Then in 1948, the Providence Journal ran a shocking story. The war crime trials had just started at Yokohama for the, what they called the Class B and C war criminals. The A war criminals had already been tried at Tokyo. They included the policy makers like Tojo. Well, in the Journal article, they talked about how Robert Thorpe had been captured by the Japanese, tortured and beheaded, and five Japanese officers went on trial for his murder. And later they reported that three of them received life sentences, one received another 20 years to a previous sentence, and the Lieutenant Commander Okuma, who headed up the execution detail, was sentenced to hang. And the next year, in fact, five years to the date, uh, May 28, 1949, Okuma was hanged at Sugumo Prison. The other four were all out under the general amnesty that occurred a few years later. Well, I left Rhode Island after college. I hadn't spoken to Gil Thorpe in probably 40 years. My brother sent me an article written by Bob Kerr, who wrote a veterans column at the Providence Journal. And in it, he referred to Gil's efforts to still find his brother's remains and return them to Rhode Island. I thought that had been settled years before. I called Gil, and we still remembered each other and reconnected. And I explained, you know, under the Freedom of Information Act, you now have access. MacArthur had labeled all of the court martial records top secret. 
and no one could go near them. But I said, under the Freedom of Information Act, you can gain access. Well, Gil didn't really know how to do it, and I did. So I agreed that I would get the records. I can't say I filled out a form and they smiled and gave them to me. <laughs> it took seven trips to Washington, D.C., two to McDill, and some veiled political threats. And they finally gave me the records. I was in Washington, D.C. I can still remember returning to the hotel room, the almost 1,300 pages of courtroom testimony. I stayed up all night reading them. I read them till 3 o'clock in the morning. And it was, a, it was a horrible story. Bob Thorpe had left Gusep Air Force Base on a strafing mission against WIWAC, which was uh, the remaining Japanese stronghold in New Guinea. He was the last in a, in a formation of 16 P-47s. The last one in always got the most flack. And that day, Bob's plane was hit by ground fire. He ditched off of Kero Island. He probably would have drowned. He had lost his raft and everything else. And a, but a tree trunk floated by and he made it to shore. He was captured almost immediately by a, a Formosan Chinese guard unit that the Japanese used to man the beaches. He was turned over to a lieutenant by the name of Fujihara and marched over the mountains about seven miles to the headquarters of the 27th Naval Unit, which was headed by an Admiral Sato and his uh, Chief Operation Officer Captain Noto informed Sato of the capture and uh, he told Noto to have the prisoner interrogated for military information. And they chose Lieutenant Commander Okumo to do it because he spoke English. And uh, according to the records, the uh, interrogation started out in a civilized manner until Okumo began to ask questions about what plane were you flying? What base did you come from? How many men in your division? And Thorpe would give him nothing except name, rank, and serial number. Okuma beat him. And then he asked a final question. He said, do you think the United States will win the war? And Thorpe replied, I think we have too many resources to lose. Well, that really enraged Okumo, and he turned to enlisted men who were standing by, and he told them, the prisoner has insulted the emperor, feel free to beat him. And he reported back to headquarters while these enlisted people beat Thorpe head, back, shoulders. When he returned, Noto told him that Sato said that the prisoner was to be executed in any fashion that Okuma desired. So Okuma walked out. Now at this point, a man by the name of Lieutenant Commander Odazwa showed up with a ceremonial sword. And they marched Thorpe to the beach. They dug a shallow grave. But before he was executed, Okumu turned to Adazwa and explained that they were going to use him for target practice first. So Lieutenant Fujihara fired first, and he missed badly. He said at the courtroom testimony that he had done it deliberately because he felt they had gotten to know Thorpe on their journey across the mountain. Yamamoto wasn't quite as generous. He shouted out at, in, in English at Bob Thorpe, I will now execute you with my pistol. And he shot him in the leg. Okuma shot him in the other leg. Thorpe never fell to his knees. He stood throughout. They dragged him to the grave, and Odazwa went through a, quote, mock Bushido ceremony. He washed Bob Thorpe's neck and the sword, but he, he had the enlisted men laughing with his exaggerated moments, movements. The final, just before he was beheaded, Bob Thorpe looked at Odazwa in a very calm voice, asked, what time is it? And Odazwa struck. And that wasn't even the end. A man by the name of Ogawa jumped into the grave and opened Bob Thorpe's chest and removed an organ, probably the kidneys. Well, the uh, 
I debated whether I should uh, share this information with Gil Thorpe, but uh, I had to. I mean, he insisted, and we sat and uh, read and cried together. Well, after I read the uh, courtroom testimony, I started reflecting on other records, and I had some surprises. Uh, first of all, um, the kamikaze kids, the spirit warriors, all disappeared when the war crime trial start, started. Uh, they were replaced by a group of whining cowards. I did it because he ordered me to, or I didn't do it. One of them even said he was never in the service, the man that desecrated Bob Thorpe's body. As early as 1945, one month after the war ended, Admiral Sato called a meeting in, in, uh, at Carroll Island, and they devised a cover-up. Two Australian prisoners had also been captured and beheaded, along with Bob Thorpe. And fortunately, well, first let me tell you what the, they, they came up with this, that the prisoners had all been captured. They were in good health. They developed malaria. And despite their most heroic efforts, they all died. And they were given full military funerals. Fortunately for us, a, a, a Captain John Steed, a lawyer by trade and a member of Australian intelligence, uh, was sent over to get to the truth. And first of all, they turned over five bodies, saying they, uh, three bodies, saying they represented the two Australians in Thorpe. And the investigation, they found remnants of Japanese uniforms. They were the remains of Japanese soldiers. And Steed quickly broke them all down, starting with the flight surgeon who admitted he lied, and then Noto. And, uh, Noto was tried and he received a tw by the Australians, and he received a 20-year sentence. And Steed turned over all the other records to the Americans. I can't explain why we did nothing at that point. As Steed went on, uh, he prosecuted uh, uh, a General uh, Yamamoto who led the, uh, was responsible for the Bataan Death March. Uh, uh, Shemashito who was responsible for the, they were both hanged because of, of Steed's efforts. After the war crime trials, the Class A finished in 47, a, uh, an intel American intelligence officer by, by the name of Chedester found Steed's files. So they went out to arrest all seven of the defendants. As soon as Sato learned that he was going to be tried as a war criminal, uh, he committed suicide in the typical Japanese way. Um, they did arrest Ogawa, who was dragged out of a hospital screaming that he had never been in the service. He was the one that desecrated Thorpe's body. The only worthwhile thing that, that he, uh, Ogawa did, he did hang himself in his underwear at Sugumo Prison, mm -hmm. the, the first, first war criminal to do so. There were other surprises I had when I started reading the court martial. First of all, I had no idea the Japanese war criminals were defended by American attorneys. MacArthur brought over 20 leading defense attorneys to defend these Japanese. Also, they also were in defense of the, of the uh, seven Class A war criminals. Um, actually, the uh, five Japanese were defended by a very astute defense attorney by the name of Edmund Peters. And he did a very credible job. He started out, Japan had never ratified the Geneva Convention of 1929, which dictated how prisoners of war were to be treated. And he also quoted, you know, the Tojo maintained since Japanese soldiers were not allowed to surrender if they were still able to fight. In fact, if they did so, they were subject to immediate execution. So because of that, they didn't feel that prisoners of war should be treated in any special way. Well, a prosecutor by the name of uh, Leonard Rand, he did a, uh, he did a very good job, uh, though I, I will say 
uh, the original sentences, uh, Okuma was sentenced to hang, three of them got life, and Noto was, another 20 years was tacked on to his, the sentence he was already receiving. But a review commission, largely based on Peters, reversed the decisions. They commuted Okuma from, uh, from uh, execution to 20 years, and they reduced all the sentences accordingly. Another review commission went back, went through the everything, and reinstituted all of the original sentences. Of course, they were, uh, they were all out, uh, with the exception of Okuma, uh, of, uh, Okuma, they were all out within three years when MacArthur declared the general amnesty. You know, when I first started writing the book, that was going to be it. I was going to talk about Bob Thorpe, the execution, the court martial. And then I started interviewing the <coughs> remaining members of the 39th Fighter Squadron. And Tom Brokaw said, this was the greatest generation, no question. Some of the things they endured. Um, uh, I started with, there was a man by the name of uh, uh, Lieutenant John Dunbar. He didn't know Bob Thorpe, that he, don't, he was only there a short time. He preceded <coughs> Bob. But uh, he kept a daily journal, was, which was so helpful when I was able to compare the actual records with John's. And it was through John I met a <coughs> man by the name of Fred Toby. Fred Toby was Bob Thorpe's best friend. They went through flight training together. They even, Fred even remembered meeting Bob Thorpe's mother, Nora, in Florida when they got their wings. And they roomed together at Goosep. Uh, Fred was on that same mission that day. In fact, Fred and uh, another great guy that I met, Lou Lockhart, they went looking for Bob Thorpe, even though the squadron had been grounded because of weather, they still went looking for uh, Bob. And then I met a man by name, Chuck Sullivan, um, great pilot and ace. Chuck Sullivan had to bail out over New Guinea, and he ended up with a tribe of headhunters, and he had to shoot his way out. He killed a chief, and uh, I guess the, one of the chief priests, and he fought his way out, and fortunately he ran into uh, some Australian coast watchers, and he got back to the 39th and was flying missions about a week later. And one of the other surprises when I was interviewing uh, Fred Toby, he was talking about the P-47. And he said, you know, uh, we didn't have any range. We couldn't, we couldn't fly, do much of anything because it was such a gas guzzler until Lindbergh taught us how to fly it. So I looked and I said, Fred, you mean Charles Lindbergh? And he said, yes. I said, all I ever knew about Lindbergh was his historic flight and the fact that he was very unpopular. He was pro-Nazi before the war. And uh, he even received a, a medal from Hermann Goering. Uh, so he was not too, Roosevelt hated him. Roosevelt said that he, Lindbergh wanted to, he was in the reserve, he wanted to go in the Air Force. And Roosevelt said he would never ever wear an American uniform. Well, Henry Ford realized the aeronautical genius that he was, so he hired him as a consultant. And then he worked also with Pratt Whitney and he went through the Pacific, and he, he doubled the range of almost every plane, especially the P-47, but the B-24, the 29th. In fact, MacArthur said that Charles Lindbergh was the unsung hero of the war in the Pacific. Now, one of the other surprises I had when I got into the research, um, I didn't realize the strategic importance of New Guinea. If New Guinea had fallen, there was no question we would have lost Australia. Australia was in jeopardy anyway. There was sub Darwin was bombed out by the Japanese. They even found uh, Japanese submarines in uh, Australian harbors. It was so bad that there were politicians in Australia that wanted to give part of Australia to the Japanese, hoping that stay out of the metropolitan areas. 
and there was a lot of, even in, with the military, uh, the crack Australian troops were all fighting in Africa for the mother country. Uh, they had a reserve made up of mainly elderly men, and they thought the best strategy was to defend in Australia itself. And MacArthur wisely said, no, we must defend from the islands, especially New Guinea. We had already lost New Britain and many of the other islands. All we had really in New Guinea was Port Moresby. He appointed General George Kennedy, pro Kenny, probably one of the greatest decisions that MacArthur ever made. Uh, General Kenny was a, was a genius. He went to uh, Europe in the 30s and examined the, especially the German Air Force. And he talked about the Volker Wolf, Wolf and the Messerschmitt. And he said, you know, we don't have any planes. We should be developing planes like this. The higher ups didn't like him. He was too much of a rebel. And they gave him a desk job until the war got started. And he was under one of MacArthur's army generals. And he walked in one day, and the general was trying to tell him about strategy. He walked in one day, and he took a pen. And he punched the, a, a hole. And he said, General, this little hole represents what you know about air strategy. The rest is me. <laughs> <laughs> when they first went to New Guinea and the 39th Air Force was right there, they were flying P-39s and P-40s. Slow, not very maneuverable. It reached a point where they did have Australian coast watchers in New Zealand that tipped them off when enemy bombers and fighters were, that had like a 20 minute window. What they'd have to do, they'd have to fly out to sea because it took them 20 minutes to reach the 20,000 foot altitude that the Japanese would come in at. When they got back to try to defend, they were already dropped their bombs or whatever and had, had, had left. So the early days of the war, the air war, well, ground war too, were horrific. But even with the P-39s and the P-40s, the 39th held its own against the Japanese Zero and some of their most advanced fighters because of the skills of the pilots. And then in 1943, the P-38 arrived and everything turned around. Because of the skill of the 39th, they, the 39th was the first fighter squadron equipped with the P-38s. And from the first day they went out, General Kenny wrote a report and 16 P-38s went out, shot down more than 40 Japanese planes and didn't lose one plane. One plane uh, suffered some minor uh, injuries, but uh, the whole war began to turn around. When Bob Thorpe was flying in New Guinea, he got there in uh, January of 1944, we had air supremacy. We didn't have ground. They still had a lot going, but we, we had control of the skies. They didn't have to worry about fighter planes anymore at that point. The, um, I think one of the things that, uh, that bothers me as I, I think back on, on the ordeal with the Thorpe family and what these, what these guys went through, it wasn't just Bob Thorpe, you know, they knew if they were taken prisoner what was going to happen to them. The Japanese hated the flyboys, as they called them. And they were, most of them were executed immediately. Uh, there were two members of the 39th that uh, one was uh, Bob Thorpe's roommate. Another uh, by the name of uh, uh, James Steele was his roommate. Uh, he was captured by the Japanese and I found the records, I got more than, I got the records of all the war crime trials. And what they did with James Steele, they took five Japanese non-combatants and they told them, uh, you have to prove your courage in another way. And I have, in the records, I have the signed confessions of what they did. They bayoneted, bayoneted uh, James Steele. Uh, Lieutenant Gene Duncan, 
another member of the 39th, was captured and he was beheaded. Well, I think the thing that uh, I have to get a book here, if you'll give me one minute. I think I remember the page. You know, I'm pretty good at that stuff, but I forget where I parked my car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot of talk about what the Japanese knew and didn't know during World War II. We had the same thing in Germany, in Nuremberg trials, etc. I'd just like to read you a passage that I extracted from a Japanese, okay. On December 13th, 1937, a photograph of two smiling young Japanese officers, Toshiki Muke and Tasana Noda, appeared on the front page of the Tokyo newspaper, the Tokyo Daily News in, <coughs> in English. The headline read, Incredible record to cut down a hundred people. Mukia, 106. Noda, 105. Both second lieutenants go into extra innings. That's a direct quote from the newspaper. The people were defenseless Chinese POWs. What is so monstrous about this story, beyond all the murders, was the acceptance, indeed the celebration, of this horror by the Japanese people. So it was to be expected that the Japanese military's savage treatment of civilians and POWs was not to be limited to the butchery of 30 million Chinese, whom they regarded as an inferior race, but would be inflicted on all of the populations and militaries they battled and conquered in Asia and the South Pacific. Well, those two officers may have enjoyed reading the story in the paper, but uh, so did the Chinese. In 1948, they were both executed. <laughs> the, um, recently, Prime Minister Abe has made the statement that there were no war criminals in Japan during World War II. Uh, they were, actually, they were war heroes, you know, carrying out I bet you didn't know that Pearl Harbor was a defense mechanism necessitated by American imperialism. A Japanese textbook that is being used in ninth and 10th grade, they devote two chapters to World War II, one to Nagasaki, one to Hiroshima. Nothing is said about the Bataan Death March, rape of Nanking, the atrocities in the Philippines. The, uh, just no nothing is said about that. Well, you know, uh, I knew I was writing the book and uh, I wanted to make, especially this state, aware of, of Bob Thorpe and what he had done. And I thought about it and, you know, in, about five years ago I wrote a play called The Murder Trial of John Gordon. and. When, one night I, during a performance, a gentleman approached me and said, you think John Gordon is innocent, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, it's a little late for a reprieve. He was hanged in 1845. So this gentleman was uh, Representative Peter Martin. And what he did, he, represent, he <clears throat> introduced a bill, and it resulted in Governor Chasby signing a pardon for a man who was executed 167 years ago. So I thought about it, and I called my friend Peter Martin, and I let him tell the rest of the story. Thanks, Ken. So, Ken and I got together at the uh, coffee shop and uh, we talked about what we had done with John Gordon and Pardon. And then we uh, decided, you know, he said, what can, what can you do for this guy? And I said, I really don't know. I'll find out for you. And I did not know anything about military protocol or anything about how we could go about this. But I was at the time, member of the House 
House Veterans uh, Affairs Committee. So I knew who to call. I, I called my friend Ed Kane, who had worked with me on everything that uh, we, have, we had done relative to veterans. And I said, I've got this request and I would like to, uh, like to get some help. So he, he had been appointed to the House Veterans uh, Advisory Committee and uh, he, that committee w was set up to help the uh, politicians up there uh, to understand the military protocol and things we need to do. So that committee got together and they set up a couple of events. And we had, we had uh, an event at the State House where we had a, uh, like a 50 minute ceremony honoring Robert Thorpe. And Ken said to me, we'll have a special guest. And the special guest was coming up from Tennessee. And this really, really was uh, a great thrill for me because I got to meet uh, Lieutenant, but actually Captain Lewis Lockhart who came up to the State House and he spoke. And he spoke about uh, his friend, Robert Thorpe. When he got up and uh, over the years, he, he seems to have sh shrunk a little bit. So over the years, uh, he, he uh, remembered his friend Robert Thorpe, but he never knew what had happened to him. So he got up and he spoke at this event, and I, I was able to ca capture exactly his words and put them into the book. In, uh, in the section of the book, we talk about the, the ceremonies. And I, re I can remember like it was yesterday. Lou get up. I remember Bob. <laughs> it's like, like, wait a minute, 69 years later, and he talks about him like he's, like it was last week. So we had a we had a great ceremony, and then uh, there's Lou, and I was able to uh, give him uh, the 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 uh, citations from the House of Representatives, and we were able to put all of those citations and proclamations in the in the book. And he came up with his, his nephew-in-law, uh, Doug Hale, who's a, who's a uh, lawyer down in um, Memphis, 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 Tennessee. <coughs> so it was a great event. I didn't have enough pictures of the veterans at that event. I, I need to get them for this presentation. But I assure you, the, the House chamber was full of military people giving proper recognition. <coughs> and. Uh, so then, eight days later, we went to the cere ceremony, the Memorial Day uh, ceremony. I should have said Memorial Day, not Veterans Day. Went to the Veterans Cemetery, and here's Gil Thorpe, and Gil was going to be with us today, but he's not feeling well. And here he is receiving the Rhode Island Star, the highest medal that you can get from the state of Rhode Island. We still haven't given up on trying to get him a national metal. We're working on that. But um, this is the Rhode Island Star, posthumously awarded the second Lieutenant <coughs> Robert Thorpe on Memorial Day 2013. And we were very happy to have the the ceremony. There was a uh, Old Glory ceremony put on by this group of, of uh, Navy people who come from right here from the Navy Hospital. And it was really an impressive, impressive event. And later on, I'll give you my, my card with the website <coughs> we built for this, back up this book. And you can actually see the ceremony on, uh, on, on the website. <coughs> then, yep. as, a, as a result of what we had done up to that point, I was pleased to be invited to the 39th Fighter Squadron's Association reunion in San Antonio, Texas. And I did not know anything about that organization, but I will assure you that as soon as I get invited, I went out and I bought a ticket. And uh, I just thought that that was the important thing to do. So I went down and uh, I got to meet Frank Royal. And this is, this is a picture two years after I met Frank. He was 98 when I met him. And this is Frank at his 100th birthday this year, June 15th. <laughs> and 
I, th this means a lot to me because, you know, we, we see young military people and then we forget. But look at, that's Frank Royal when, when he was actually the commanding officer of this organization. And I, I love the fact that you, you can really recognize him. So he was, he was a great help. And then I was down there speaking. I just noticed I had the same suit on. This is my speaking suit. <laughs> and uh, so we had a great time. And then Representative Marvin Abney, who, who flew down, and uh, he, was, he spent the week in Washington, D.C. at a seminar. He got up on Saturday morning and flew to San Antonio to be there to help me <coughs> make this speech. And he handed out all of the citations. And then we got together. And uh, it was a great, great memory. And then finally, on uh, June 12, 2015, we placed a marker that was made by the uh, VA at the cemetery. And here's Gil and Ken, where Gil is signing off the paperwork necessary to say, we recognize the fact that it, we, we will never get the body back. So this, this paperwork authorized the people in charge of the cemetery to put a plaque in the uh, Michigan Action section. And then we are celebrating it. And uh, this is the plaque that's in the ground right, right at our feet. And then uh, John Kennedy referred to the romance that was documented in the book. We're putting this presentation together. Ken's original book was going to be Broken Trust, and it was going to be about how the United States government had totally ignored the Thorpe family. And it was kind of, if I may say, narrow and more negative than the book that we ended up with. And so we were very fortunate to receive love letters from Mary Morgan Martin. No relationship to me. I don't know if she's related to you. But Mary Morgan Martin. Is the is the child of uh, of uh, two people that were in the war? So th this this is this is a uh, Mary Louise Scott, her mother, and she was a, a nurse in uh, in Australia, and she lifted. I had to put this picture in because <laughs> this is a romance, and for anybody that ever pursued a young lady back in those days. This was the house, house mother <laughs> that he had to get past. <laughs> and, and, and I got to give the guy a lot of credit. It worked. You know? and we make a movie. We're looking for somebody to play this part. <laughs> because this, is, this is wonderful. So anyhow, in, in spite of Mrs. Fields, they had a nice romance. Started in 1942. And uh, Mary, second lieutenant, Mary Scott, and at the time, George was the second lieutenant. And then they uh, carried on in their, he would fly over to Australia <coughs> to see her. And Ken tells the story about one of the guys flying over to Australia and uh, bringing back a, tr a, a plane full of beer with the empty bomb, bomb base and going over to get, get beer and bring it back. So then, uh, he says, I met Mary in Tacoma and flew her back to and Florida. Uh, she sat in the co-pilot seat and was the first person in the family to fly with me. We're married in the base chapel with Chaplain Charles B. Smith officiating. And now, tell me something. Don't those two look like movie actors? Yeah. I mean, it's like, really. If, if somebody made a movie and he put people like that in it, I'd be saying, ah, oh, that's not real. <laughs> but that's the real people. And we had a great time with, with Mary Morgan Martin getting all these <coughs> pictures and there are well over a hundred photos on the website. We couldn't put everything in the book. And there are maps of the area <coughs> and uh, we put a lot of love letters in there that George was writing to, his, to, to Mary and then letters home to his parents. So George had uh, completed 147 missions. He was called back after he and Mary were married 
to, to fight in the Battle of the Philippines, his P-51 was hit by ground fire. He radioed that he was returning to the base, but the engine failed and he was forced to bail out. His, his body was struck by a plane and he died instantly. Mary was three months pregnant at the time. So our friend Mary Morgan Martin never got to know her father. And our thanks go to her. And she, she made the ultimate sacrifice when you think about it, giving up your father without ever knowing him. And it's, it's our good fortune that she provided us with all the love letters that her mother had saved over the years. And a lot of those love letters are a subplot in the, in the book and made a con significant contribution to the book. So Ken and I would like to acknowledge the book came about because of the cooperation of the 39th Fighter Squadron Association. Patrick Conley wrote the foreword. Uh, former Secretary of Navy William J. William Middendorf wrote the epilogue. Governor Chafee was involved in helping us to get all, all of the honors again, like he was with the John, the John Gordon case. The Rhode Island House of Representatives uh, Committee on Veterans Affairs was very involved in helping us with, with their staff and the Veterans Advisory Council. We have to thank the VA for providing the, the um, monument and the Veterans Cemetery for uh, all they did to, to make it happen. So there's Robert Thorpe, 20 years old, sacrificed his life. <coughs> and there are, there are some pictures of the uh, 39th Fighter Squadron. I have a lot of other pictures that I will just show you that are all in, in the book or in the website. And the plane, a lot of the guys. And Ken can help me because Ken, Ken is old enough, he remembers how these guys' names. <laughs> this was the 39th on its way to Australia. And this is when they had the P-38s. That's Roy Sir, who was a chief engineer. On the website, when you look at these pictures, the legend underneath the, uh, <coughs> the pictures will tell you who all the people are. Let me you hold it there. Yeah. yeah. This was Tommy Lynch. Tommy Lynch and Dick Bond were the two greatest aces in the war in the Pacific. As a matter of fact, Dick Bond was the leader. Um, they used to, they were allowed to fly their own missions. The two of them would just take off and sort of freelance. <laughs> and unfortunately, one day they, they spotted a, uh, a small Japanese ship. What they didn't know, trailing behind the ship was a, a bunch of the, it was sort of a trap. Lynch went in on a strafing mission, well Bong did too, and, but his plane was hit and before he could get out the plane exploded and he was killed. Dick Bong, who was the leading ace in the Second World War, he returned and they, they didn't want him to fly any more combat missions. So he was designated as a test pilot. And on the same day that the atomic, the second atomic bomb, bomb dropped, he was testing the plane they called the X-99 and it malfunctioned and he was killed. So the two of them did not survive the war. They did. That, yeah, that's Dick Bong. That's how I went. That's Jack Frost. Uh, believe it or not, that's his name, Jack Frost. Uh, he's still alive, he's 94 years old, and he gave us a lot of great information. Well, yeah, that's their encampment. I think that's it. That's it.
I wasn't standing by Peter because I like him so much. It was the microphone. <laughs> if you're interested in knowing more about this topic, please come up and take one of the, these cards. In the back of the card is the website. Uh, Ken didn't tell you that when I left office a year ago, we got act actively involved in producing this book, and I became the chief nerd behind the the uh, production of the book. And it was been a, it's been a great pleasure, and uh, uh, it's been fun. Thanks. Do you have questions? Uh, no, there were no co-pilots. Just those one lines. pilot. Yeah. They had the P-39, P-40, P-38, P-47, P-51. They were all single. Single. Yeah. Ken, why were the atrocities covered up? That part I don't get. Well, I, I can understand a little bit of MacArthur's position because in, in 1948, things were heating up and MacArthur knew it. Korea. The North Koreans were making a lot of noise. The Russians were making a He wanted to get them over and done with quickly. Nuremberg was a lot quicker, okay? They went through because the, the Japanese war crimes, um, I, I went blind reading all the, but the fact is the translation problems, some of them, some of the things ended up very humorous because what you would have the American prosecutor, like the trial of these five, he asked in his opening remarks, he requested the death penalty for all five. Well, the Japanese audience is sitting there. They don't know what's going on. Two minutes later, when the translation finally gets to them, they're ooh and an owing when they're on to another subject completely. And that, that happened frequently. And the, even the, the, the Japanese, I don't know, I have to be, be careful how I say it, but the Japanese, even in a lot of conversations, tend to shout. Yeah. You know, what is your name? I am Lieutenant Fujihara of the 27th. You know, we, we, we would just normally say I'm such and such. So a lot of that went on. And the Japanese, they're not used to defensive. They're not, that's why we had to bring over American attorneys. And there were restrictions, like uh, and the, the first day, Peters, uh, as I said, he was a very astute lawyer. And in his opening remarks, he said, why isn't the greatest war criminal in the Far East, Emperor Hirohito, here today? And he was admonished by the, by the court-martial panel. He was warned never to bring Hirohito's name up again. That was on MacArthur's orders. MacArthur did not want... Hiro, they had made a decision that Hirohito would not, it was Hirohito who set, you know, Jimmy Doolittle's uh, Raiders, and I had the, so I interviewed Jimmy Doolittle once in 1955, and it was one of the highlights of my writing career. A very, he had a reputation, Jimmy Doolittle did not swear. And the reason I was sent to interview him in 1955 it was the 10th anniversary of the ending of the war. And they were having a special ceremony in Washington, D.C., in which Japanese representatives were coming. And it was, I guess, kind of a love-in. I was sent, and I interviewed Jimmy Doolittle, and we talked about the raid and, and what he went through. To, and a very modest man. Well, the interview was over. So I got up and I started to leave. And then almost as an afterthought, I said, oh, General, will you be going to Washington, D.C. for the festivities? His face got very red, and he stood up, and he said, those Japanese bastards killed my boys. I wouldn't sit at the same, you know, yep, yep. table with them. Well, when I started walking out, he, his adjutant, who was a lieutenant colonel, was still there. So we walked out, and he looked at me. He said, Sergeant, that's off the record, right? I said, it's off the record. <laughs> so it never, it never appeared. But you know, the, uh, when Peter was talking about George Morgan, uh, th there's a story in there. That I, I, I think I've been around a lot of things. It almost made me cry because, you know, this man had flown 147 missions. 
and they was called back. And Mary sent me, in fact, it's in the book, Mary sent me, she found it in a newspaper that was published in 1946. It was yellow with age. Her mother had cut it out, and it was called Missing Him. And it was beautiful. It was anonymous. I tried, I searched, the, I had people searching. The, I could not find the author, but it was just a, a beautiful poem. And you know, we, we mentioned God bless the 8th Air Force and everything they went through. But you know, if they got shot down, they bailed out over Germany or France or Belgium or Holland. The guys in the 39th or the whole 5th Air Force, they bailed out over the worst terrain in the world, New Guinea. You know, filled with, you know, 22 years after the war was over, Nelson Rockefeller's son was on an expedition in New Guinea with the crew and some other anthropologists. And the crew tipped over, and he was the strongest swimmer, so he swam to shore and disappeared. And they sent over investigators. They finally got to the truth. He had flown into a camp. He was murdered and eaten. And so the, uh, this is, uh, this is a tough area to fight a war in, and they lost, uh, there was, they called it Black Sunday. It was in uh, April of 1944, 300 planes of the 5th Air Force went on a mission against Rabaul, and when they were returning, they had this Owen Stanley mountain range in New Guinea. It was totally fogged in, and they lost 37 planes that day, not to enemy aircraft or ground fire. They lost them to weather. And then Lula, uh, Fred Toby, the, the man we talked about, Bob Thorpe, Fred spent three years in a VA, VA hospital after the war. In 1945, about a month before the war ended, he was taken off on a mission. And these P-47s were always overloaded with gas. And, they had more fatalities taken off from New Guinea than they did in actual combat. And Fred's plane was taken off and he, it crashed, completely engulfed in, in, in flames. And I had the whole story in the background. And his flight engineer jumped into a Jeep and drove into this Holocaust and pulled Fred out. He was horribly burned. I mean, you, you still saw, uh, when I interviewed him seven years ago, you still saw evidence in his neck. He had had a lot of plastic surgery. But uh, ironically, his flight surgeon, a uh, flight surgeon, his flight engineer, the one who saved him, uh, Fred lived in Tampa, Florida. This guy was from Michigan. He retired in Tampa. So he and Fred reconnected. And I said, gee, it must have been like old times talking over those stories. And Fred looked at me and said, he would never mention that. He would consider it, you know, not, not in good taste. And it was, Fred Toby straightened me out on another thing that I really had trouble understanding. When I first tracked him down in 07, I called him, I told him who I was and what I was doing, and he welcomed me to his home. And we went out, we had dinner that night, we talked all day, he showed me photos. When I told him what happened to Bob Thorpe, he started to cry. And he said, I didn't know that. And I looked, you know, unfortunately, I'm an old investigative reporter, and if I got a question, I got to ask it, and I've gotten into a lot of trouble over the years. But I said, you know, I don't understand this, Fred. You told me, you know, you met Nora Thorpe, Bob's mother. They went on leave together to Australia. They did everything together. I said, I don't understand. Why didn't you contact the Thorpe family after the war? And he looked at me, he said, Ken, you, you don't understand. He said, when somebody went missing, we pretended like they were transferred. We didn't want to know anything else. We didn't want to know the truth. And he said, I always suspected Bob probably died that way, but he said, you know what? I couldn't face it. So it gave me a little more understanding. Thank you.